because much of the offseason has happened uh, without you being here, Keith. We thought maybe uh, you could help run through the top five signings and occurrences of the offseason thus far to kind of set us for January 3rd. What, what else we look forward to? Yeah, guys, a little jumping off point for the new year. We've got five storylines, mostly transaction-based, as you said, Maddie, and we'll start in Texas with the Rangers revamped rotation here. I've obviously they were mine. big spenders last off season, but bring in this trio here. Obviously we know what DeGrom does. He speaks for himself, but Nathan Evaldi, a guy who later in his career has really learned how to pitch and has been an above average starter for each of the last three years. And Andrew Heaney with big swing and miss stuff, potentially slotting in to that number five spot. Now this all three is a of those guys, all star pitcher. Yes, all three of them could be high end all star pitchers if they're able to stay on the field, which all three of them missed significant time last season. Good so point. how that plays out in Texas with the offensive additions they made last year, kind of bolstering the rotation this year. Tough division, obviously, with the Astros always at the top. But how does that work out in Texas? Yes. Uh, right, good job. Of I say it worked out better. Soundboard through that. Soundboard. That was just Harold interjecting his random thoughts as per usual. I've What's learned from the best, age, powering through all your soundboard clips over the years. <laughs> all right, guys, number four here. How about the catching carousel in the National League? You knew I was going to have my team in the mix here, but to me the interesting thing, all these teams in the National League is kind of a revolving door behind the plate. Both Contreras, Contreras brothers now in the National League Central. Sean Murphy traded to Atlanta. Omar Narvaez, a little bit of a stopgap there for Francisco Alvarez, the number one prospect in the game for the Mets, who's going to be a catcher when he gets up. Probably DH some too, but spend some time behind the plate as well. So we know G JT Real Muto in Philadelphia, Will Smith in Los Angeles, but all these National League teams now have premier guys behind the plate, or at least new guys with some of these teams as well. So how that catching situation works out, especially for my Cardinals, that's one of the big things to watch. Now, number three, we mentioned the Phillies. Hey, how Keith, I was going to say real He quick. blew right past the fact that that's a huge question mark. for It's a big gamble for the Cardinals. I, I, I got to ask you, every time I see that, I just think about all the fights they were in. I, that's going to be the compelling story for me is getting along with that. I know everyone wants to focus on Molina being a defense first catcher, Contreras being an offense first catcher, but one thing they have in common, even though the lines are kind of blurred in that Cubs Cardinal rivalry H, those, those guys are both going to mix it up and keep the uh, edge of the team sharp, so to speak. So I do like that about Contreras, even though it's going to be a little weird seeing him in a new uniform. There you go, number three. All right, number three, guys, Trey I Turner. We talked about this at the winter meetings. <laughs> we all do love history, H. How about some history here with these black and white photos? Players to lead the league in stolen bases and total bases. You add that type of player in. Well, that doesn't make any sense. In Philadelphia. Well, it normally would not make any sense, but he's got a rare combination of speed and power, Snuffy. particularly his, his batting average. So Trey Turner going to Philadelphia with that stacked lineup. That's the number three. Now enter soundboard Matt or Harold. Any of the three will accept. By the way, that was not soundboard Harold. That was actual Harold asking what Snuffy Sternweiss's name is. Um, yeah. Snuffy. Look, I'm with you on this one. Trey Turner, his impact is immeasurable. And people lost sight of that, maybe because it happened early, maybe because the Mets have been hyperactive in the free agent market. Maybe it's because the Braves have fleeced the A's again with another huge trade and added to their talent depth. I still think the Phillies are going to be really good and have everything to say about the pennant, not just the division title. I'm back in the Phillies this year because of what you just mentioned. Yep, I'm with you. We'll go to the other coast for the number two storyline. We hit, we hit on a little bit in the first segment with JP, but how about the Padres and this lineup that they're going to run out when Tatis gets back? More than half of these players have played shortstop in the major leagues. Now, I think we have an idea of who's going to be there this season with Bogarts on the left side of the infield, but how this all shakes out with new guys in new places, JP mentioned the possibility of one or two of these guys potentially moving at some point, either before the season or during the season, specifically Kim. So how does everything shake out in the West? Matty, you talked about it in the last segment. Padres finally knock off the Dodgers last year's postseason. Have they closed the gap enough, or will it be status quo with the Padres chasing the Dodgers? That new-look lineup, though, is going to be interesting no matter how it shakes out. Yeah, I don't think there's ever status quo in San Diego. I think A.J. Preller is the new Jack McKeon. Um, he's every bit the trader sensibility that uh, Jerry Depoto has. And if, in fact, they make a trade for Grisham or Kim, and JP's going to have a little bit more on that later, that wouldn't surprise me. The thing that surprised me most about that division as it pertains to the Padres ranking is the fact that the Dodgers have been in stand-pat mode all winter. Now, it's, it's January of 2023. 
We were led to believe at the winter meetings that maybe the Dodgers, for various reasons, tax ramifications, et cetera, might be more active now this calendar year. They haven't done much, man. And look, their season ended in disappointment last last year. Yeah, but I think what, <clears throat> what everybody's chasing is what the Dodgers have. Strong farm system with young players that can come up and fill in. That's what the Braves have done. You know, and, and that's why they continue to stay up at the top. And I think that's why the Dodgers have been so sustainable. What, what Andrew Friedman and those guys have been able to do over his run in L.A. is you don't have to panic if you don't sign free agents. That's true. And, and there is a trade deadline that's going to come in July, and a lot of these guys are going to be sitting out there floating around. And I'm telling you, I'm not convinced that the Dodgers, if Carlos Correa's years drop, don't think that they're not going to sit there and go, Hey, if it's five years, we might be in on that. Well, that's a that's an intriguing suggestion too. All right, Keith, yeah. we're we're on to the we'll top see. thing. Number there one. There's only one more. Yes. <laughs> there is only one more. Right. Thanks for that. Good Chris. to hear from the dog early in the morning. We'll go from the second biggest market to the largest market. And H, I know it's something you wanted to mention. A little anniversary today with the boss, and he'd be happy to see this with the money flowing through yeah. New York on both teams. Judge signs the third biggest deal in the history of the sport, the largest ever for a free agent. And the Mets, obviously, Correa is still up in the air, but we include that money. They're getting close to three quarters of a billion dollars on free agents this offseason. So just all the activity in New York. Well, how this plays out with Correa, but the back page is alive and well. No, I love it. It's, uh, you know, when you sign a guy back like Aaron Judge who comes through your organization, I was saying this the day that it got done. If the Yankees can't do it, then where are we at as a sport? Mm -hmm. You know, when you develop a guy, you keep him. But I do want to throw this at both of you. And everybody else out there. 50 years ago today, January 3rd, 1973, George Steinbrenner purchased the Yankees. And his impact on our sport has changed it totally. You know, I don't think baseball's in the position they're in if he doesn't do all the things that he did in the sport. I'm going after free agents. I'm going to go ahead and build this empire. I'm going to do all these things. His, his enormous handprint on the sport changed everything. No, this is 50 years ago and, today. And interestingly enough, you know, looking back at it, the league didn't always like it at yeah. the time. Uh, but now that we have some perspective on his impact, I couldn't agree more. Well, he, you look, and we're seeing it now on, on the other side of New York with Steve Cohen. Not a lot of people wanted him jumping in there doing what he's doing either. But he's already changed the free agent market right now. It's changing the sport. Yeah. And we'll see if you look back years from now, his impact. But today I want to talk about Steinbrenner. I just think that. Uh, he was he hit the sport in so many different ways and he did so many things it's important to have people like that that are jumping out front 50 so years wow 50 years 50 ago years today. ago